Ladies and gentlemen, the Shred Gaming Zedicom video, DirectX 12 has a huge performance gains over DirectX 11, as we saw just yesterday with my testing, which is linked in the video's description. Now, normally, I do add this commentary, as many of you know, in the actual testing video itself, because we ran across a myriad of different CPU configurations as well as GPU configurations to see the differences pretty much in the draw calls. I'm sure many of you have heard of the uh, API overhead test, which is part of, of course, 3D Mark. But we didn't include the audio in that particular video because of a couple of reasons. One, I actually wanted to think about the results a little bit, and we were running ridiculously short on time. I actually was about an hour late going to bed last night. I had to be up really early this morning for work, um, and I had to actually ask Amy slash Amata if she would actually edit it for me, so I had to transfer all the footage online. It was a bit of a pain in the butt. The second reason, and um, probably the more pertinent one, is I actually wanted, as I said, to digest the information, but also to speak about it a little bit lengthier than what perhaps the benchmarking videos would possibly allow. So, what are my opinions on it, uh, of DirectX 12? Well, firstly, it's important to remember that DirectX 12 testing which is part of FutureMark, is at the end of the day synthetic. In other words, it does not mean that when we see DirectX 12 games, they're necessarily going to be 17 times better or 15 times better either visually or frame rate wise. What it does mean, however, is DX12 in a pure synthetic environment, in other words, sending CPU instructions, well, instructions from the CPU to the GPU, it's infinitely better it's magnitudes better it's massively better i can't even describe to you how much better and that's pretty impressive because how it turns out is it, it can actually lead to its implications where the gcp of the gpu that's the graphics pro that's the uh, graphics command processor actually takes a second it can actually store the gcp from actually issuing instructions to the GPU. As many of you know, the CPU issues commands to the GPU, and it's the GCP's job to say, hey, shaders, I need you to do X, or I need you to do Y. In other words, it basically governs what the how the GPU interprets the instructions from the CPU, in, in basically layman's terms. So, you're getting these situations now where potentially the GPU can actually pretty much be slowed down by the GCP. So you're getting a, a situation where unlike previously where the, the software just couldn't um, issue commands fast enough simply because of the massive overheads and the parallel issue problems with DirectX 12, now it's completely different. Now you're getting situations where the CPU is either bound simply because it's busy, pretty much maxed out, it can't issue any more draw calls across any thread, or uh, the GCP just simply is holding it back it's like hey i can't deal with all of these instructions wait a minute bro but it's a pretty it's an interesting situation and we do know that some of this stuff is going to be resolved um and we do know that the um the uh gp the gpu is going to be able to basically issue its own instructions it's particularly important for like loops and stuff um, or basically repeating commands, so if it needs to constantly issue the same command over and over again, rather than the CPU having to issue that command, the GPU can do that, which is certainly an important thing, and is basically called execute indirect. It was actually something that Max McMullen did discuss in the GDC presentation back, um, of course, in uh, early March on this very same subject, so that's quite important. Um, so what about the actual performance numbers? Um, as you know, they are all, all in the article and you've seen the videos possibly yourselves. If not, do go ahead. But I just, I don't want to bring up all the performance numbers. I just want to concentrate on a couple, um, which are, I found the most interesting. So for example, with DirectX 12, um, in terms of one CPU core. Now what I mean by one CPU core here is I actually went into my... Okay, apparently I knocked down something from the table in case you wondered what that random noise was. Uh, my foot decided to destroy all. Anyway, as I was saying, so I, what I did is I basically went to the BIOS and I disabled all CPU cores aside from one and I disabled hyper-threading as well. So effectively you've got one thread, right? And yes, Windows 10 was bloody slow to load. In fact, at one point 
I didn't think it was going to be able to. But I digress. So with that done, DirectX um, manages, depending on the GPU and luck of the draw, but around 600 to 700,000 draw calls ish, right? That's DirectX 11, which isn't great, but it's not awful considering. You know, you might say, well, it's just one CPU core, blah, blah, blah. Well, here's the thing. Here's the dealio. DirectX 12 manages 4,100,000 on the R9-290X. The GTX manages 3.6 million, and Mantle um, hits about 1.4.1 as well. In other words, that's huge! That's not subtle! That's absolutely bloody gigantic when you consider that it's only able to issue that command from one CPU core, not multiple CPU cores. And what I'm, the point I was actually trying to get with that benchmark isn't that, oh, hey, you know, DirectX 12 is much better in a, in a multi-core environment. It's that it's actually so much more effective even on a single CPU core. And when you consider that that on a single U CPU core batters the living crap out of, let's say, the four-core test with hyper-threading, for the GTX 780 uh, tie, it hits, not that there's that much difference, by the way, uh, with a lot of graphics cards, um, it's not really shade abound. But the 780 manages to hit 1.3 million with DirectX 11. The DirectX 11 on the R9 manages 1 point, well, basically 1 million. So that's insanity. It's four times the amount of one CPU core with DirectX 12 or Mantle than what it is with all CPU cores, part hyper-threading available with DirectX 11. That, to me, is massive. And it gives you an indication of exactly where we are in terms of performance with DirectX 12. Now, let's just be honest. Once again, to reiterate, this is synthetic. The purpose of the test is for the GPU to be issued commands to draw as many boxes or sorry blocks as possible and to keep the performance uh, over 30 fps so in short it's doing pretty much what we expected it's it's just it's an unrealistic expectation you're not ever going to see instances of this in games but what it does do is it illustrates that one of the big problems with pcs one of the big issues with direct with uh, DirectX 11 is just that it just hasn't been able to do that in terms of objects in terms of the number of objects that were you know available in terms of the number of objects that it could actually draw and handle and send to the, C the GPU it just wasn't able to do that and while of course you can still definitely get GPU bound situations on the PC there are certainly scenarios where you can't necessarily get the level of foliage detail maybe that you expected because foliage is incredibly difficult well maybe not difficult to render i mean you can do it you know if you go watch a hollywood blockbuster they're managing to render foliage but of course it's extremely expensive they're not having to do that at 30 or 60 or 120 fps um which is definitely extremely expensive now <clears throat> i have to say this is slightly off the beaten topic of DirectX 12, but as an actual operating system, I'm really impressed with um, Windows 10. Uh, in terms of driver optimization, it's working really well. I do, I would like to do a little testing um, overall with games um, using DX11 or below, but so far I've not really had any problems. I've messed around a little bit with Alien and a couple of other games just for fun, actually, not really for any other purpose. You know, just in my own private life. But I, for one, actually am really happy with what Microsoft have done. Now, I do realise a lot of you have actually asked me, what about Vulkan? Because I was supposed to do that this weekend, or previous weekend, um, late March and afterwards. But I wanted to get these tests up first because two reasons. One, everyone was covering them. And two, I wanted to actually understand it. Um, and I wanted to be able to write about it, put something out on it from my perspective, and to actually really, to 
yeah, just basically understand a low-level API because it's like we've had Mantle, but the problem is Mantle, it's the same issue. It's like it, we've never really had direct comparisons. And you know that I've tested uh, Mantle on the ex on um, R9s before. I've tested it on the 280, I've tested it on 285, and of course the 290X uh, with a variety of different games like Thief. And all you have to do, by the way, is if you're curious on just instantaneous gratification, just look at some of the Mantle tests that we've conducted and you can just see the massive difference. I mean, Mantle did make a huge difference in terms of performance, even on the on even on the R9 280, and I'm not trying to blow AMD's trumpet here. I'm just using it because, hey, it's an API that's available. It's low level right now. I do want to throw out some thoughts, however, regarding Vulkan. Um, I don't really want to discuss Mantle in terms of its future because, frankly, I don't really know what its future will be. Uh, don't get me wrong, if you own an AMD card, it's a nice feature. You know, there are Mantle games certainly still being made, and there are Mantle games probably still going to be made in the future. And, of course, there are Mantle games now, so hey, you know, it's a bonus. But how certain its future is, is completely unknown. The dark horse in the race, the one that I think I'm as excited of potentially is Vulcan. Now, I'll be honest, I'm still reading a lot about Vulcan. I've actually downloaded some uh, white papers and I'm, I've got to do a lot of reading on it. But the reason I'm extremely excited about Vulcan is because it's cross-platform. The problem with DirectX 12 is... It's very vendor, or at least very operating system specific. <clears throat> now, that's not to say that you can't recompile or develop for multiple platforms. So, for example, let's assume that a game is being released on the PS4 and the Xbox One, or the PS4 and the PC, or what have you, then of course that's what the developers have done. But in the case of Vulkan, it has the potential to really, really change the ball game. And of course, we do know that major developers are behind it. Um, I believe Valve included. So it's like, if Linux is to ever be taken seriously as a gaming operating system, I know some people are going to rage at that, but let's face it, if you're a hardcore PC gamer, like a really hardcore PC gamer, and you want to play all of the latest releases, you can get around it. I'm not saying you can't. You can. There's certainly ways around it, but... It's a pain in the butt, and 99% of people are just not going to do it. It's like you could run Wine, you could run all these different things, you could, you know, you could run Dual Boot, you can run... But most people, if their primary purpose in life is just to play games on their PC, they're going to use Windows, or they're going to use the operating system that's the easiest. So I do think that Vulkan has the potential. I do want to learn more about it, and I will be putting something out, hopefully this weekend. But yeah, DirectX 12, I'm extremely extremely ecstatic about um i i'd heard a lot about it and we all know about brad wardell and his numerous tweets and blah 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 and you know it, it's good to hear about that stuff and i knew about the performance and benefits of low level apis because of, once again mental but it's it's a completely different thing to actually see the bloody thing running and to see these huge performance numbers i mean one of them one of them that I'm seeing, um, but just another one that sticks out to me. Once again, I'll just use the R9 as the example. But the R9, with hyper-threading enabled, um, with four cores, you're getting 1 million on DX11, right? On the other hand, you're getting 17 million, 600,000 with DirectX 12. Mantle is a little slower, it's about a million slower. Mantle sometimes is a little faster, or at least about the same. It does depend on the conditions and criteria. But either way, that is insanity. 17 times faster. That is just crazy talk. One last thing before I go. Um, I'm pretty sure people are asking me um, regarding hyper-threading. Because the hyper-threading results on the... R9 are better than NVIDIA. Now, there's a couple of things I want to quickly address on that. Firstly, you remember these drivers are beta. They are beta for both AMD and they are beta for NVIDIA as well. Second point is it's not a finished operating system. And the third point is it's only a synthetic test. 
I'm not saying that, that you're going to get the situation where, you know, it's impossible, where hyperthreading is not going to benefit AMD more, because it, you know, it, it is possible. But it does depend maybe on how the drivers are interpreting hyperthreading. Maybe it's something to do with scheduling or something. But what I'd noticed consistently, at least on my setup with my CPUs, with these drivers, blah, 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 is that hyperthreading actually made it slightly slower on the GPUs that I was testing with NVIDIA. Whereas on the other hand, with the AMD CPUs, uh, so the AMD GPUs, it was an absolutely massive performance increase. And that was true both with Mantle and with uh, DX12. So I'm pretty sure that NVIDIA will be changing some of that stuff. But I wanted to point it out because some people have asked me about it. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I am going to be shooting off. But for now, I'll get going. So take care. Bye for now.